Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with Todd Burke. What is the name of your studio, Todd? I call it Lime Street Studios. Uh, For obvious reasons. I'm on Lime Street, yeah. Yep. So, Todd, give me a little bit of your journey. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in an actual cornfield in Colorado, <laughs> in a little one stop light town. And uh, you actually grew up in the cornfield? Actually, in the cornfield, between two. <laughs> 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 no, but I, yeah, I grew up rural. I, I, was a, I was a farm kid uh, in Colorado. And uh, after high school, I moved to LA. This was 94. And I got a job at Grandmaster Recorders, which I think you've worked there a bit, right? A little bit, yeah. Did, did, yeah. I, never like for weeks and end, just like days here, days there, because it was yeah. a Neve room that yeah. you could afford. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, and with that, with that low rate came a fair amount of you have to maybe you have to fonzie fonzie a module together to make it work. Yeah, There's a lot of that. Uh, but you know, growing up in a room like that, I think uh, you know it, it makes you a good engineer. It makes you. But when uh, they're 94, what albums did you do? Did you do, were you there with the Foo Fighters? Oh, yeah. So when I, when I got there, Sylvia, had just, Sylvia Massey had just made uh, Undertow with Tool. Yeah. And I got started, uh, I, so I worked with Sylvia. I didn't work on, on Undertow at all, but I got, Sylvia was around quite a lot, and she really took me under her wing um, for the first Amazing. couple of years, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and she, I, I don't we just hit it off, and she started instantly hauling me around to Sound City, into a couple other studios, working on working with bands, and uh, it's fantastic. I learned I learned that was that was really the beginning of my whole career was uh, a couple years with Sylvia, and the Grandmaster. Uh, I only assisted for a couple years. Uh, the Foo Fighters came in and made Color in the Shape. Uh, so with Brad, with, yeah, so Brad was a good buddy of mine. Gra- Brad also came up at, at Grandmaster, right? And uh, so he was another big formative uh, uh, creature in my life early on. Love Brad. Yeah, he's the best. No doubt made a record, uh, made their first record at Grandmaster during that time. The second record? Uh, Tragic Kingdom. Yeah, second record, yeah. I, yeah. I remember. We, yeah, Matthew Wilder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, I think we, we, it was only about a week. They did some overdubs, uh, about a week of overdubs. Uh, and what else? And then I guess the big turning point for me, Ben Harper, uh, I assisted a, another record with Brad um, that was Ben Harper's uh, a record called uh, The Will to Live which I think is his second record. Um, and at the end of that record, the, uh, the producer, there were a couple of producers, and they, they gave me a little wink on the way out. And they're like, hey, you should, you should, get, your, you should get your act together because we've been talking about it, and there's, there's a pretty good chance we're going to hire you to record Ben's next record, which blew my mind. I wasn't in any way ready for that, right? But, I, but it was, you know, it, I, I was suddenly just, uh, it really kind of energized me to really, you know, to figure out this engineering thing and get my get my act together for this next record. Um, and I did. So I just, uh, I mean, that, that was that was my start. Um, Great. So I had a couple years there at Grandmaster of just really uh, working. I would assist during the day and then at night dig up uh, outtake reels uh, out of the vault. And there were some old tool tapes in there, um, some old Red Hot Chili Peppers demos and stuff. But I'd grab those reels and just mix them. Uh, Fiddle around with him at night and just in that you know, on that neve uh, and just figured out how to figure out how to be an engineer really uh, and then sure enough uh, a year and a half later or whatever Ben came in to make his next record and I engineered it so at twenty I think I was twenty three or maybe twenty two uh, I engineered my first major label record and then had a little got a little run based upon that great and that was my start well um, after Ben Harper record what was the next album we did a Jack Johnson record then. Wonderful. Yeah. I made a couple records with Sylvia. And then uh, I connected with Tony Hoffer and did about 10 years. I was, I was Hoffer's engineer for, oh, I think, right at 10 years. So we had a run of records. Did you do the Thrills first record with him? Mm, Husky did the first Thrills record. Yeah. And then I think that then it was about that time that then I came in and right. uh, took over as engineer. I did the second Thrills record. So I wonder I, if you... <laughs> yeah. Right, right. yeah. I remember that. Yeah. With Saudi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then we did the third one. We, then we went to Canada years later yeah. and did the third one, I think. Yeah. Uh, but I had a long run with Hoffer. We did a ton, right. of, a ton of stuff, you know, and it's Sound, Sound Factory, Sunset Sound. Um, and then my daughter was born nine years ago, and it was kind of around that time that uh, I decided I didn't want to work 14 hour days anymore. So transitioned, uh, uh, transitioned into uh, film primarily. So there's a couple composers in town that I work with a bunch uh, just mixing, mixing underscores. So that that's been the last ten years or so, um, and now this Atmos thing—you know—it it feels like the world's uh, there's sort of a new landscape here. 
post pandemic where there's not a lot of movies in post. There's not, I'm not seeing a ton of underscores coming my way, but this Atmos thing is kind of emerging. So uh, that's where I'm at currently. Amazing. Yeah. But the Atmos thing is fantastic. I absolutely love it. It's a fucking blast. Um, endlessly sort of, uh, it's just so fun creatively to get into the, get, get, get the, a listener within the very center of a song. It's just fantastic. You know, love it. How long have you been here? I've been back here for about 10 years, mixing, you know, and I've been through the thing of I started with 5.1 and then to 7.1 and now to Atmos. Um, and mostly the last 10 years has been a lot of film scores um, and the occasional, uh, you know, a few records a year, a lot of, a lot of film scores. And now post-pandemic, uh, it's been, there's been a lot more Atmos record work coming in and less film scores, just there's not much in post due to the pandemic. But, uh, you know, go with it. Just go with it. Be the, be the water. <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. I couldn't help but notice when we first came in, mm. the Aurora. Yes. This is actually, so this is an Aurora sidecar. This is the very first one. This was the prototype. Oh, um, wow. It doesn't have the right rails. It doesn't have any rails, actually. Jeff handmade each one of these uh, modules. It's not even serial number one. It's serial number, there is a serial number one out there. This is serial number zero. It was the one that was the proof of concept. But uh, it sounds fantastic. These are really good stuff. You know, Jeff, Jeff's idea was to take uh, where Rupert was going with the Neve around 1970, I don't know, two, uh, and sort of stay in that class A place and like imagining uh, he hadn't gone to class AB where we might right. be now. I'm looking at the EQ points. Yeah, it's four band EQ. You got a selectable, selectable band, uh, selectable Q width yep. on the mid bands. He did a kind of cool thing where you can do, uh, you can adjust uh, the gain range on the top end low band. So, not that we're really mastering through it, but. You know, if you want to get a little bit more fine-tuned on the top and low end, you can go to the lower gain setting, and, it, and you know, it's nice. It sounds great. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff here. He also made, this is the thing that he made called the Jeff Tanner Mixer, the GTM, yep. which went into production. This is another prototype of his. I don't know how many he sold. He, there may be two or three in the world, but yep. that's, that's a 24-channel. There's another, there are banks of eight down below your knees there. Yeah. But that's a 24-channel uh, mixer. And I don't, it doesn't get a lot of use anymore. There was that time, remember when Pro Tools was sounding a little boxy and we were all about summing amps, and outboard sure. summing, and it, and it did seem that there was a, a real improvement there. Yeah. Uh, I used this quite a lot in those years, but the, the math has gotten better. Right, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you're, you're using this for you track in, drums here? Yeah, inputs, I don't know, but all, I mean, this, this place is, I'm, I'm just mixing back here, really. I'll jump in the booth and shake a shaker and a tambourine on a mix here and there and do some vocals sometimes. Um, so it's a little bit overkill, but I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and it travels with me. I take it to Sunset with me a lot. Um, not that they don't have great gear, but it's, it's, nice. it's a nice color to have. I like to have this color with me all the time. Which, uh, yeah. which room in Sunset do you have? I mean, three, of course. Same here. Yeah. 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 I spent a lot of time in one, and that, that was, a, that was, a, that was a, uh, a favorite for at some point, but once, once you figure out what you're doing in three, yeah. there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the way the low end builds up in the room. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a beautiful sounding room, and the fact yeah. that there's so many areas you can put band members and instruments. Yeah. You go, oh, I'll put drums in the, in, over to the left in mm. that. No, I'll do it in the piano room with the glass. No, I'll do it in the live room. I'll, You've got the whole hallway for amplifiers hallway, and stuff. Everything, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I love that place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big fan of that. So you've got an Atmos room. I'm a little afraid to tell everybody about these speakers because... <laughs> You're going to let the cat out of the bag well, before I've gone out and bought them. So, it's a really good idea. Do you know the, did you know the 1031s back in the day? I, the I, I use 1032s and 1031s. I own okay. them. Yeah. I love 1031 A's. Yeah. Absolutely loved them. And yeah. back in the day, too, and I, and I caught, I had some of these. At some point, I had a 5-1 system with 1031 A's, and then I used these 1029s to fill out the back of the room. Yeah. And I quickly realized, these 1029s are great. <laughs> uh, so, when I went to sort of fill out an Atmos array. I went with these 1029s thinking that, you know, this is a pretty small space. I'm kind of 15 feet by 15 feet. Yeah. So this is very much a near field Atmos yeah. situation, right? This is about as tight as you can get and be within Dolby spec. Um, and they just felt like a good match and they are. It sound, they sound really good back here, you know? And how much are you paying for these? I don't think I've ever paid more than a grand for a pair on Reverb. Wow. I think I've found, I think a couple of these pairs I maybe found for a few hundred dollars, you know? 
So, Eric, go on a reverb now. <laughs> David, don't start buying them up. <laughs> I, I um, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. Yeah. But I have 1032s and 1031s, so I could keep those on my front. Yeah, so they say you want your LCR, at the very least, you want your LCR to be the same thing. So oh, you maybe, do? Yeah, and then you could kind of float the rest with something. Um, so yeah, 1031s would be great up front with these filling out the thing. It'd be a great, it'd be a great array. You better buy them quick. <laughs> so tell us a little bit, how are you mixing in immersive in here? What's your, what's your setup? What's your, what's your IO? So the, this galaxy, so this gets into a whole talk about antelope audio and I'm a huge fan. <laughs> right. Um, I've been a few, through a few of their interfaces yep. and you know, they've always had, they're, they're the kings of these single one use one U interfaces with just a shocking amount of ins and outs, right? Yep, so yep. this is the newest one called the Galaxy 32. It's their newest sort of uh, generation of interfaces. And like the Orion uh, series before it, it's 32 analog ins and outs plus Dante and Maddie and there's some ADAT inputs. And there's a pair of sort of mat- what, they, what they deem their mastering grade D to A converters for mm-hmm. your main monitor output. It's just a ton of stuff in one box. And it sounds... As we all know, the Avid, Avid's never made the greatest sounding hardware, and when you find something that betters it, it's it's usually not subtle. And I think the Antelope stuff is so much better. Uh, but that's it. So that's that's my entire. This is my entire setup. Is just that one that single. Device. So you're not using like a dad or a, you know the dad and the mom and all this stuff. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the Avid Matrix, that's their new, you know, yeah. and it and it's it's their sort of solution for Atmos, where you've got uh, an interface. That then you can do all of your various base. So are you using a matrix then? No, so I'm just using this galaxy. So this means you don't need the matrix. You I don't, don't need the matrix. The dad, I don't the mom, the whatever. No speaker controller. For a, at, at some point, I'd use Martin Sound made a really great 7.1 controller I used for a long time, mm-hmm. and which I had. I was for a minute had two of them in here to control the Atmos rig, but that's sort of when the gears started turning, and I got in touch with Antelope to talk about figuring out this immersive functionality so that's what they did um they built uh an entire a, a, a sort of an ideal solution for an atmos room into this into this one box it's very cool that's amazing. so that's my whole system i'm, I'm coming d subs out of the galaxy straight to my speakers and are you running with pro tools yeah so treat me like an idiot because i am um if you had to open pro tools um, what is what is the software that's controlling this? How are you? So Pro Tools, you know, yep. when you're mixing immersively, you'd, your Pro Tools would be feeding the Dolby renderer. Yeah. Uh, I there's a couple ways to do that. I'm using the Dolby Bridge, it's called, so I can get 128 all 120 objects to the renderer natively. I don't have a I don't have an HDX card anymore. Um, this is all just a native system. Uh, and then from the renderer, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm going Dante Virtual Sound Card out of the renderer to uh, over Dante to the Galaxy, and that's that's the entire that's the entire rig, and then the Galaxy is doing uh, all my speaker controlling, bass management, sort of all that stuff, and that's the functionality that we just built into this thing that they're I think they're announcing this week actually. So what Antelope has put together here though is um, it's pretty cool. I'll run you through their control panel from the beginning. So the first thing you've got this this first routing tab, and this is sort of your digital patch bay, let's say, and like a patch bay, outs on the top, ins on the bottom. Right, so I can patch any anything from the back panel, a line input, uh, my da- the Pro Tools output, the Dante lines, anything can patch to anything else. So that includes, though, it, you come, it comes with four mixers here, which you can do various things with. I do a thing where I take the output of all of my Atmos outputs, I sum them uh, to stereo in this mixer, yeah. and then that feeds my metering. Just, and which is your meter? Is it the VUs at the top there, or is it you're talking about the iPad? It's all of them. I've got a pair of Duros there, <laughs> the VUs, and that iPad is, used, is a software called Decibel that I love. And right. it'll, it'll show you LUFs and show you, particularly it'll show you long, long range LUFs, which is the, so you can, the target we're always after on, any, on the overall level of any mix is based upon that integrated loudness, and Decibel does that. Nice. Other things with these mixers, I'm, uh, I've got a composer that I work with a bunch. I set him up so that all of the keyboards in his room are all the time going to a pair of headphones near the keyboard station. So regardless of what I'm doing on Pro Tools, I can be doing a mix or doing anything. If he's got an idea, he can always go over to his mini Moog, put on a pair of headphones and be playing. And that can all happen independent of what's happening in Pro Tools mm. through these mixers in the Antelope software, right? So Fantastic. whatever. So all that to say, these mixers are very handy. 
you've got a bunch of, you know, kind of like a UA thing. You've got a bunch of plugins here that you can patch either before or after Pro Tools, or you can do hardware loops from Pro Tools through, the, through these plugins. That all happens on this software. Do you use any of their plugins for Atmos mixing? Not so much. Not so much for the Atmos thing. I use them. I mainly use them on the way in. So if I want to throw a 1073 across uh, a mic pre that maybe doesn't have an EQ in it on the way to Pro Tools, mm -hmm. I can apply some EQ on the way in, and then that's right. done. That's committed, right? But in terms of Atmos, this is sort of the new. This is the the thing they're announcing this week, and this brand new functionality is this surround tab. Uh, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> so let's just, let's just run through it. From the routing panel, though, yep. uh, in order to use this, you know, you'd take, I'm taking my Dante outputs because, as I said earlier, the, when I'm mixing Atmos, I'm mixing to the Dolby renderer. The Dolby renderer is going Dante out to the antelope. So my Dante inputs here, 1 through 14, I've drugged down to the surround pane input. And then I'm packing How is the Dolby renderer up? Integrated into Pro Tools. Yeah, so in Pro Tools, uh, yep. you can set your playback engine to Dolby Bridge, and that gives you uh, 128 channels, essentially, to the renderer. Right. And, and that would be the maximum. That's that the maximum spec. Uh, so then from the renderer, the renderer outputs a 7.1.6, uh, a in my case, output, or 14, the, the 14 outputs over Dante to the Galaxy, and that's what I'm mixing here on the in the surround panel. Um, but the surround panel is cool. So you know, it, it basically takes the place of I don't need, uh, as we said, I don't, I don't need a speaker controller. I don't need any exterior external devices whatsoever to, to handle my speakers, to tune the room, to handle the speaker delays, kind of arrival time delays. It is all, that what I'm seeing there? Here. That EQ. That's that's for the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You know, once once you've routed your outputs of Pro Tools into um, into the surround tab, then you know you'd select your room layout. Mine's seven point one point six, and this is much like the renderer. It, it looks just you know we're trying to kind of match this feel, um, so it doesn't feel like you're in a new uh, you know it sort of feels sort of familiar. Uh, but this is this is my seven point one point six output. I can click on any given speaker, and from there, then I can tweak uh, whatever I need to for that for that channel, um, including level. So I can I can sort of trim everything up. Uh, can do delay here to tenths of milliseconds. EQ, of course, and then bass management is a thing that can be a little bit tricky to get to get going uh, in an Atmos system. But what we've done is built a bass management mixer so that uh, I can lop off the low end of all of my satellite speakers, sending that to the sub, along with, uh, mixed in with then the actual LFE channel. With these speakers, where are you uh, crossing over? I'm crossing over at 90, which, 90. Is, which is a pretty, and it isn't even based upon the speakers as much as that's just sort of a Dolby, that's just sort of a standard. Okay. That's a Dolby standard. You could do it differently, but... That's that's sort of the emerging standard, it feels like. And when you're mixing into the satellite speakers around, you're very conscious of EQing stuff with no with nothing below 90 going into them? How are you? No. So this this is just on playback. On playback. So okay. I could send a mini moog to the side yeah. speaker, right? It's only going to go to the sides, the, the side channel. Sure. Or 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 that object in the renderer, but just on playback, uh, in the in the controller software, it's going to send 90, 90, 90 cycles and below to the sub, to the sub rather right. than to the speaker. Right. Yeah. So, but and, and you know, if you've had a, if you've used a sub in a two point setup or had a two point one setup, I guess that would be technically. Yeah. Um, you know, your speakers tend to last a really long time. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not blowing out your woofers constantly. Yep. Um, I love having a sub in the room. Uh, and, and what uh, sub do you use? Mm, I've got a little KRK down here. Right. It's a I think it's a ten S. I think is the number. Right. Um, but you know, this is a fairly a fairly small spot, so I, I didn't need a, I don't need a massive sub. But that's sort of the run through on this thing. You know, it, you've got a, a controller. You can control the overall level here, which you can also control from the front panel here. Right. And excitingly, they're going. They, they they haven't made it yet, but I think in the next few months they're going to release a little box, something something along this area. Yeah, yeah. That will have a volume controller and some some uh, buttons to select various routing options and stuff. Great. So there will be a little desktop thing coming at some point. A but this is peripheral. saving a whole bunch of hardware you have to buy. This is saving a tremendous expense. 
Yeah. yeah. Like you could, you could very easily spend 10 grand uh, without even turning around on a, on a, on a uh, speaker controller. For Top Atlas. of your head, how much is the Galaxy? 56 or something. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I think it's the, it's the best sounding game in town. And, you know, the only thing that, that is in that same category is the Avid Matrix, of course. Right. Um, and, you know, I would argue, you could argue Sonics um, between the two. And you could, um, in terms of usability, I think Antelope has done really well in keeping this entirely full featured. But it's not, there's no real bloat. You know, it's, the, the, the Matrix is pretty complex. Um, you're going to spend a few days figuring that <laughs> figuring that thing out, you know. Right. Uh, and I, I feel like this this one's a little bit a little bit cleaner. Dare I say? But with the Matrix, do you need to also buy any separate stuff? I don't, I don't know how don't that works. I don't think you do. Aaron Matters does has, the dad come with? I don't know. There's the dad and the. I don't think you need it because is that or the do little you? the little desktop controller? That's like another five grand. Yeah. So you you said when I came in, you're like. I was like, well, let's talk about uh, the immersive. And you said, well, I'm, I'm the analog guy. So <laughs> uh, I I'm do not, see tape machines. I've got some tape machines. I mean, this yeah? is all just for effect. But it's all, it's, it's fun. I was the analog guy for a very long time. And, you, you, you know, you remember what it, you remember the beauty that a, a quarter-inch tape machine will do to a bass guitar or sure. whatever. And, but, I, you know, I mean, we all talk about that stuff. And it's all so sexy and good-looking and in, in practice. It comes up two or three times a year, probably. <laughs> <You know>? Sure, <laughs> but it's you know when it's right, it's right, and it's worth it, it's worth keeping this stuff around for the uh, for the occasion that it does work. We have an AA to your twenty four track, yeah, and it's been a while since it's been fired up. That's right, fired um, up now and then. Keep those yeah. keep those caps charged. I'm looking around mm. at some of this gear over here. <laughs> so what, what's this? What's this? What's this sort of? Homage. I to... mean, it's the it's an homage to what nineteen forties uh, electrical. If you were a if you were a teenage electronics wizard, this is some of the stuff you'd probably have in your bedroom. A lot of Heathkit stuff. Uh, I don't know why I got into. It. I just started collecting. This is the stuff that I used to have a ton of gear, of course. And as it's all as I, as it's sort of cycled out of here, for some reason I just haven't touched that corner. <laughs> What what the, what are the what's the stand up mic pre's over there? Yeah, so that is that is a uh, there's allegedly one of the greatest mic pre's ever made lives in that, and I haven't pulled it out yet, but that's a uh, you would sweep a room with that. Basically, it's a it's a, a super narrow bandpass filter. Yeah, you plug in a mic and blow some pink noise in a room, I suppose, then you would sweep through the bands and watch what the meter does to sort of see what the huh. frequency response of the room was in like the 50s or something. It's test equipment from the 50s. Ah, I see. Allegedly a very, very great mic pre. Again, I need to go digging. And then the pair on the left-hand side mm, under the mic, what is that? That's an equalizer from Grandmaster. So back oh. in the, I don't know, there's, there's a long and detailed history of Grandmaster that's got a lot to do with cocaine. <laughs> I know some of the stories. <laughs> so that, but at some point in the, I guess, early 80s, they decided to get rid of the console and they were, they'd make a custom console. Hmm. And remember the other room was, it was made for quad and it was sort of round. Yeah. So they made a console that the engineer could sit in the middle of the room and it was a round console that went at 360 degrees around mm. the engineer. That was the equalizers. Those are, that's a pair of the equalizers from that console. And they were custom made? They were custom made. Yeah. Wow. I think it's an op amp slab design, slightly tweaked. And, and you're, yeah. when you're talking about the mic pre, you're talking about that big thing in the middle. Yes. The huge thing. Yeah, that, that great big huge thing. Yeah. So Eric, that's what he's talking about. We do it. Wait, so he knows. To and get then the rest right. of it is just, you know, whatever. It's signal traits. All that Heathkit stuff is just kind of electronics doodads from the 60s. What is, what is that hi fi amp down there? Is that a quad? Is that reverb? There's a spring reverb there. Oh, that's a spring reverb. Yeah. Oh, wow. It looks like a hi-fi. Yeah. So you'd, <laughs> you would use it in your hi-fi to give it a little dimension. Uh, <laughs> but it's great. I mean, you know, you make an altiverb anymore. You made an altiverb response of it and use that. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tweaky little spring reverb. Todd, thank you ever so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Please leave any comments and questions below um, and have a marvelous time recording and mixing.